So my presentation along the lines of what Salvatore discussed is called wellness as fairness. I will concentrate on the wellness aspect because Salvatore covered quite a bit of the fairness aspect. But um, let me talk first about the multiple domains that exist within wellness and multiple connections. So I do adopt a definition of wellness similar to Paul Dolan, uh, who said experiences of well-being is basically about experiences of pleasure and purpose over time. And I add to that definition different domains of well-being. So well-being is experiences of pleasure and purpose in six domains of life that we call the I-COPE, uh, which stands for interpersonal, community, occupational, physical, psychological, and economic well-being. And I want to acknowledge the work of my colleague here, Dr. Samantha Dietz. Raise your hand, Sam. So we've done a lot of work together to validate instruments uh, that measure well-being along these six dimensions. And uh, what we found out was that there is a high correlation between each individual level of well-being with overall well-being. So this confirmatory factor analysis basically shows that these dimensions are both independent but highly correlated to overall levels of well-being. So we really have to pay attention not just to psychological well-being or, or physical well-being, which is usually what people talk about when they talk about wellness, but really wellness is a multi-dimensional construct, and all of them are important. So we know, for example, that people who experience greater levels of social support, experience lower mortality rates, less degree of stress, more positive outlook on life. So there are many uh, benefits from interpersonal well-being in other domains, in psychological and physical uh, well-being. We also know that happier people, psychological well-being, are more cooperative, more flexible, more resilient, physically healthier, they live longer. So what I'm showing you now is the interconnections between the six I-COPE domains of well-being. In one of the studies we conducted, we found that married people, as an indicator of being together, of having emotional support, married people experience higher levels of well-being than divorced or single individuals in most ICOP domains. And we also found that full-time, part-time, and retired people experience higher level of well-being than unemployed. Uh, we also found that people in management and professional occupations experience higher well-being than those in service and manual labor. And this basically confirms many other studies that were conducted all over the world, including the famous Whitehall studies by Michael Marmot, according to which the higher you are on the occupational food chain, so to speak, uh, the better health and well-being you experience. We also found that more income leads to higher overall and psychological levels of well-being. But for this to occur, there has to be a big gap in income. In other words, if I'm making $40,000 and you're making $50,000, $10,000 doesn't make a big difference. But if I'm making $25,000 and you make $75,000, then we will see a considerable difference in levels of reported well-being between these two groups. Now, as I said uh, here, small gaps in income do not make much of a difference. The only domain of well-being where small increments make a difference is obviously in economic well-being. Now, so this is about wellness. Six domains, they are all interacting with one another. Now, let me say a word or two quickly about fairness because uh, Salvatore covered most of it. But as uh, was mentioned before, there are different domains of fairness. The two principal ones are distributive and procedural. Salvatore talked also about retributive. And this is a model that I developed and published a few years ago. The printing is kind of small, but basically what you see at the bottom are different levels of well-being, interpersonal. We have interpersonal here. A organizational community well-being and different levels of justice. These are the blue, this is the bottom blue a side of the sphere and at the top we have different levels of well-being. And the basic premise is that the more you enhance justice at the bottom, the more you enhance well-being at the top. 
And the research that Salvatore uh, covered a few minutes ago just goes to show, for example, that at the community level, the higher the level of social justice, the higher le of le the level of well-being. And there is a lot of research documenting the same within organizations. There is a big literature on organizational justice, and also we all know it from our families and relationships, interpersonal well-being is the same. When there is a lack of interpersonal justice in our relations, we are suffering emotionally, psychologically. Now, so this is the social justice index that Salvatore already covered, so I just wanna point out there uh, in the arrows that the green arrow is for Canada, that's where I used to live about 15 years ago. Then the, red, the yellow one is for Australia, that's where I moved after Canada. And the green one, the, other, the red one is for the US, which is where I moved later. So according to this graph, I'm getting sicker every time I move countries. <laughs> uh, so, so now let me say a word or two about how to change, how to improve well-being. So we understand the different dimensions of well-being. Now it's really important to make a difference, to improve well-being. So we developed a model called Bear I Can, which are strategies for change. These are seven scientific principles that cover uh, behaviors, uh, emotions, thoughts, interactions, context, awareness, and next steps. So we developed an online intervention. It's called Fun for Wellness, funforwellness.com. And we teach individuals key skills in order to enhance their well-being in different domains of life. So for example, we teach them how to set a goal. If you want to improve an aspect of your life in the I cope domains, you have to set a goal. I want to lose weight, uh, for example. I want to eat more uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, I want to lower my stress. Uh, I want to volunteer in the community. These are all goals. So we, we teach people how to set a goal. We also teach people how to cope with negative emotions and how to collect positive emotions. Uh, we teach people how to challenge negative assumptions about their lives. Many of these assumptions, as in the story that Salvatore showed, the little cartoon, these assumptions we internalize, we begin to blame ourselves for, for problems that are really societal problems as opposed to intrapersonal problems. We teach people how to connect and communicate. We teach them how to read cues in the environment. We tend to think that we have more willpower than we really do. We human beings do not have a lot of willpower. So everything you hear about, it's all within your head. If you make a choice, it's all overrated. We have to have conditions that make it easier for us to pursue healthy choices. I am vegan. I have money to buy vegan organic food, right? So my house is full of really great food. It costs a lot of money, but I'm making an environment that is healthy for me. There are a lot of food deserts two blocks from where we are right now. There are food deserts in Miami where people cannot have access to green vegetables for a reasonable price. We have to read the cues, what's happening in the environment that is influencing our behavior. We have to know ourselves, we have to know the issue and we have to make a plan and make it stick. So what do we do? We put everything into a, a website consisting of games, videos, humor, interaction, in order to engage people in innovative ways to promote their health and well-being. So the program, as I said, it's called Fun for Wellness, and we conducted actually last week, we had a major paper published in Prevention Science, uh, we did a randomized control trial, and basically this is a summary of the results. There were improvements in well-being in the perceptions of psychological, interpersonal, community, and economic well-being. People also reported that they took more actions to improve their well-being in the interpersonal and physical domain. We, we created a new lifestyle measure to see whether people walk more, eat better, whether people uh, resolve conflicts with their loved ones. Based on that index, we found out that people engage in more interpersonal solutions and physical solutions, and we also found the improvements in self-efficacy, which is really important. 
So I'll just keep the statistics. They are now in the journal Prevention Science. We're working on the paper for the actions. And this is a paper published in Psychology of Sport and Exercise. Okay, so now I think I have another three minutes. So I talked so far about strategies for personal change. Now we need to talk about strategies for community change. Because if we're serious about creating conditions for well-being, it's not enough to talk about what we need to do intrapersonally. So uh, there are really four key strategies to pursue well-being in the community. And we need to overcome what I call the deficit, reactive, arrogant, and individual blaming approach. I call this the drain approach. So we need instead to engage in a strength, prevention, empowerment, and community change approach. I call this the SPEC model. So I'm just gonna take a couple of minutes to explain how this works. So as you know, um, and as was manifested in the cartoon that Salvatore showed, a lot of poor people tend to be blamed. They don't get loans. Uh, there are a lot of stereotypical thinking uh, about this prejudice against poor people. You are poor, I'm not gonna give you a loan because you're probably not going to return it. Well, it turns out that Muhammad Yunus created a bank in Bangladesh called the Grameen Bank, according to which poor people could get credit at a decent interest rate. And lo and behold, what happened? When he built on people's strengths, he lifted from poverty six million people by giving them an opportunity to receive loans at a decent rate. This is an example of not just beating the odds. You will hear here a lot, about, a lot of talk about beating the odds. We have to talk about changing the odds. This is what, what he did. So, um, so what about prevention? There, there are some Londoners here, so I'm sure this is a story famous for folks in London. Uh, in 1854, there was a cholera epidemic in London, and uh, nobody knew how to cure cholera until they called on John Snow, and John Snow uh, didn't exactly know how to cure cholera either, but through epidemiological observations, he figured out that people were drinking water from this contaminated water pump, the famous Broad Street pump. So what he did was he ordered city officials to remove the handle from the source of the contaminated water from the Broad Street pump, and he stopped the cholera epidemic. What did we learn from John Snow? that sometimes you don't know how to solve a problem, but you may be able to prevent it altogether. So, this is a famous quote that we preventionists like, no mass disorder afflicting humankind has ever been eliminated or brought under control by treating the affected individual. John Snow could have cured five, 10, 15 people with cholera, but the key solution is to get to the root cause of the problem. So we need to prevent instead of react. Finally, let me say a word about empowerment. You all know these famous people. And the beautiful thing about empowerment, empowerment is not just that it's a tool for social change, but empowerment is also a tool for personal healing. So we need to fight conditions of injustice because injustice has deleterious repercussions on everybody, but we also benefit greatly because it enhances our sense of control. So now it's 10, so let me finish with this uh, picture. We have some Italian colleagues. Everybody knows where this is from. This is from Venice. And for me, Venice is a very good metaphor of what happens when you're trying to change a bad condition by yourself. So what's the problem with Venice? Venice is sinking, right? So the problem with Venice is that if it is slowly being submerged, Individual citizens cannot afford to ignore their collective fate because in the end, they all drown together if nothing is done. So this is the message of community well-being. Thank you very much.